Stuart Graham from the Long Now Foundation. Welcome to uh, a different venue for the seminars about long-term thinking. Uh, I want to make one space-related announcement from Long Now. Some of you may know that we've been involved for several years with a uh, project called the Rosetta Project, uh, which is got it's called RosettaProject.org, and it's putting uh, increasingly all the languages in the world online in one place. But it originally started out as a uh, as an attempt to prove that you could do serious hard copy in a non-digital way. I'm trying to get at the wonderful demo here, which I'll just wait instead. <laughs> the, uh, on March 2nd, just a couple of weeks ago, a rocket called the Ariane 5, which like you can tell that it's French, <laughs> the Ariane 5 went from French Guinea uh, into a, an 11 year mission. This is not, this is uh, slow space exploration. To go to a comet uh, which rejoices in a, uh, originally going to go to the comet Mertonin, but they missed the launch window for it. So instead, it's going to the comet 67P, uh, Triumoff. Garrow City Micro. And uh, it's a comma which orbits the sun, you know, very eccentric orbit, you know, about every six and a half years. In 11 years, the Rosetta Project, which is what it's called, that's why they wound up putting a Rosetta disk on it, uh, will rendezvous with the comet and then land on it and attach to it. Uh, there'll be two parts, much as there was with the moon. Uh, one will land on the comet and the other will orbit. And a disk, a three inch nickel disk with a thousand languages represented on it, micro etched, uh, the same text in, in a thousand languages uh, from Long Now is, will be there orbiting that comet. So if any time in the future somebody wants to go back and find out a thousand of the languages that were extant in the world back in then, what they used to call the 21st century, uh, we'll be able to find them. So that's Long Now's contribution to space. Rusty Schweikert's contribution to space is uh, enormous. Now, I'll just mention a thing or two besides what's in your, your introduction card. I first encountered Rusty in the late 60s. I was doing whole Earth stuff, uh, basically pushing uh, what the image of the Earth from space would do for people. And what I was sort of dreaming and, and promoting, Rusty was actually living. And he wound up giving a talk to a uh, kind of a philosophical group on the East Coast that I got a recording of, and we wound up printing it in the Coevolution Quarterly as an article. It was, the title was No Frames, No Boundaries. And it was a uh, basically a telling of what happened with Rusty on the Apollo 9 mission. He was uh, the first to go EVA without an umbilical. Uh, he went outside into uh, raw near Earth space with nothing but a tether. Uh, holding him to the, to the spacecraft. And while he was out there doing work, uh, there was a delay, and he uh, had some time to do nothing but hang there in space, being a near Earth object all by himself, watching the Earth scroll by underneath him. And uh, something uh, irrevocable happened. And he had a realization that uh, he was in a situation where he wasn't looking through a window, he wasn't looking through a television screen. He was, he was in the big view. There were no frames. Everywhere he looked, it was all space. And where he was looking was down at the earth where, lo and behold, there were no boundaries. And it was all connected in a uh, very non-political way. And basically what he was seeing was, in a sense, all at once, all of life. And also realizing that his connection to that, being a live person wanting to go back there, but also being outside, that he in a sense was representing life, looking at itself in the large scale for almost the first time. And that he had the privilege of being life eyeball for a short while out there. And uh, like many of the astronauts, he uh, was never the same after that. And since then, he's gotten interested in other near-Earth objects, and he's here to talk about them tonight. Rusty Schweiger. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, the prox 
proximate reason that I'm here is because Stuart and I were doing some work in Canada last year for the uh, Canadian Nuclear Waste Management Organization, um, who are uh, a new group of people, uh, part of the Canadian government, who have been assigned the responsibility for figuring out how to uh, safely and responsibly deal with nuclear waste in Canada. And uh, in that process, uh, the question came up, because they're looking, obviously, long term, so it uh, fits right into the Long Now Foundation, right? Uh, one of the questions was, uh, you know, over 10,000 years that we're trying to store this stuff and beyond that responsibly, uh, do we need to worry about asteroids or near-Earth asteroids hitting us? And uh, I said, yeah, you probably have to think about it. And uh, so Stuart happened to be there that session as well, and he said, hey, that would be pretty interesting for uh, our little Friday jobs. So uh, that's how I got here. So he said, okay, how about talking about the asteroid threat over the next 100,000 years? Now, I would uh, normally not start off this way. I'm going to work my way around here so that I can see the screen myself. Screw you on your disc. Good luck at opening it. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to stand off to the side here. I hope I am I still audible in the back. Okay. All right. So, uh, okay. So the first question, of course, is you know what threat. Uh, I then want to talk about the local cosmic environment. Um, some options for action, in fact, because this is an actionable bit of intelligence. And uh, in the end, I want to ramble a bit about uh, my feelings and my thoughts about the evolutionary context of what it is we're talking about here. Well, this is uh, what we're talking about in terms of the threat. Um, uh, in this particular instance, uh, uh, this is an artist's image of uh, what the Chicxulub impact down in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula might have looked like. Uh, this is the one that you would recall um, occurred 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs and about 75% of all species that were alive on the planet Earth at that time. We've got some more artists' conceptions of this thing, various images of what it might have been like. But what I want to do at the outset here, just so that you get a feeling for this and recognize that this is an extremely exceptional event. This is not a normal what we might expect, uh, uh, you know, a lot of. Nevertheless, this has happened many times to the Earth, uh, the most recent one being 65 million years ago of this size. Um, the diagram to start from is probably this one up here. Um, when one of these asteroids, this particular one that came in, was about 10 kilometers across, this is actually a bad drawing in terms of scale, but the actual impactor was about 10 to 12 kilometers in diameter. Um, when that comes sailing in at about uh, 47,000 miles an hour um, to an impact, it not only explodes and, uh, and vaporizes itself, but it literally sends up, digs out, excavates from the Earth billions of tons of the Earth and throws it up into the air and vaporizes a lot of it. Uh, most of it it sends up at near escape velocities. About 5% of the uh, ejecta actually escapes back into space. Uh, most of it terrestrial material, not the original asteroid material. Um, and of course you have an incredible shock wave, a seismic shock that goes out. Um, you have a tsunami which is uh, created instantaneously, huge waves that would have gone well up uh, into Texas, in fact probably uh, past the northern boundaries of Texas for example. Um, but those in some sense are the local events and those are, are going to be happening within a matter of uh, a few minutes. But most of the stuff that gets thrown up into the air, uh, as I said billions of tons of rock ends up coming down because it goes up into ballistic trajectories out through the atmosphere into space. And like an ICBM, each one of these uh, billions of ICBMs, little ones, end up raining down all over the Earth. Not just locally, but around the whole Earth. 
So they go out on looping trajectories, and many of them have come raining back down through the atmosphere. Of course, when this happens, they become incandescent as they come back down through the atmosphere, as any re-entering body uh, would become. Um, the result of that is that you literally have around the planet, say one to two hours or 45 minutes to two hours after the impact, you've got these incandescent rocks hurtling down through the atmosphere, landing all over the planet. The temperature of the sky uh, after about an hour becomes on the vicinity of 1500 degrees centigrade. The result of that is that you have instantaneous flash fires, spontaneous combustion of all vegetation around the planet. Um, not only do you have, of course, then all of the uh, toxic gases and things from the molten rock um, and hot rocks falling, but you've also now got a lot of soot and smoke, again, totally filling the atmosphere. So for a matter of uh, uh, several days, you probably have conflagration all around the Earth. Um, at the same time, uh, with all the soot and smog there, uh, once the fires burn themselves out, now you have a total darkness because no sunlight reaches the surface for as much as, say, two years after an event of this size. Um, once, uh, of course, uh, the whole chain of life, uh, or most of it, uh, disappears. In this particular case, about 75% of all species. The reason it's not 100% is uh, several interesting reasons, but it, it turns out when you do the detailed analysis, this, this microphone's difficult, bear with me. Uh, when, when you do the detailed analysis, what you find, in the same way that lava flows will cover the island of Hawaii, nevertheless there are always these little islands. Norm, what are they called, Pahukas? I'm not too sure. Okay, there's a, there's a name for these little islands that the lava flows all around, but you, you always have certain regions uh, somewhere around the Earth where uh, it didn't burn. It didn't have a, enough of an infall to create the, the same devastation. As a result, you have refugia for life in various places. And once the, uh, the, the nuclear winter disappears, uh, life begins to reemerge. Um, let me give you one other uh, uh, factoid on this, uh, again with the atmosphere at something like 1500 degrees centigrade from something like this, in an event of this size, the Chicxulub impact, about, it, it's thought that about one meter of the ocean's surface boiled away in, in this event. There are impacts that have occurred on the earth in which all of the water of the earth, it's about a 50% probability that we were hit throughout the life of the planet by a 200 meter asteroid, in which case the total ocean would have boiled off. So these are huge events that, that, that we're talking about here potentially. Um, you meant 200 kilometer? 200, what did I say, 200 meter, 200 kilometer. Thank you. Well, let's come down to a, a more frequent uh, event. Uh, this is the, the Tunguska event that occurred in 1908 in Siberia. Uh, this was a very small, uh, about a 60 meter uh, diameter asteroid that came in. Uh, it never reached the ground. In fact, until they're about 150 meters in diameter, they will end up exploding um, as air bursts, not hit the ground. Um, it depends a bit on the composition of the asteroid. Uh, but in this case, it was a 60 meter asteroid that came in and exploded at about 18,000 feet, 20,000 feet. Um, the explosive force was about 10 megatons equivalent of energy. And uh, without creating a crater at all in the forest in Siberia, it nevertheless blew down um, uh, 2,100 square kilometers of forest, absolutely flattened it and burned it. Uh, if you superpose that 2,100 square kilometers on the city of London, this is what you get. You, you would have, instead of wiping out one person, as happened here, a reindeer herder apparently, um, you would have wiped out, uh, what, 8 million people or something like that in the city of London. So it's all in where it comes down. At the, um, at the silly end of the scale, uh, from time to time, 
a rock comes through somebody's ceiling, ends up in their basement or in their bedroom, or in this particular case, a woman's car uh, got penetrated by a, an asteroid fragment in Peekskill, New York. And these things you'll read in the papers, uh, you know, every couple of months, actually somewhere in the world. Well, you know, we're not alone in this, and if you, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out when you look at the moon that it's characterized by craters of all different sizes. Um, in fact, everywhere you look at the solar system, here's Mercury, and again, at the large scale or at the more detailed scale, um, what you're seeing are craters, 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 craters. And of course, those craters are all caused by, um, not all, but almost all caused by asteroids that have impacted these bodies over the life of the uh, solar system. This is Mars. Uh, here you're seeing uh, signs of an atmosphere and erosion features and sand dunes, things of that kind, but nevertheless, you've got craters also all through it. Of course, when you get to, uh, oh, th this is a, I couldn't pass up this shot of Mars. This is looking straight down on Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. Um, this is about uh, three times as high as Mount Everest, about 23, 27 kilometers high, about 500 kilometers across. And even though you have a caldera here, a volcanic caldera at the top, on the side slopes you've got impact craters uh, even, even there. So here we have um, our share on Earth. These are uh, sampling of about three of, excuse me, three of about 190 or 200 or so that we know now uh, that we found. Uh, evidence on Earth. This is Meteor Crater in Arizona, about 1.2 kilometers. Wolf Creek in Australia, and the Manicouagan uh, impact crater in the Canadian Shield. This one is about 70 kilometers across now. It was originally about 100 kilometers across, but it's eroded down. <laughs> so these things come in many sizes and, and uh, many different shapes. Once in a while, um, although I won't talk about them much tonight because it's only about a 1% uh, portion of the threat uh, comes from comets. But it turns out that in 1994, uh, an awful lot of attention got shifted to near-Earth asteroids and impacts in general uh, because uh, Carolyn Shoemaker uh, was looking at a photographic plate one evening uh, when they were looking for near-Earth asteroids, and she saw this very strange shape in the, in the photographic plate, uh, when they blew it up, this is what it turned out to be, and it was in fact a comet, uh, which was broken up going around on a close pass by Jupiter, broke into 23 or 27 fragments. Um, all of the people at JPL and orbital mechanicians from all around the world had a ball trying to forecast uh, precisely what its orbit would be. And, and found out that it would impact on Jupiter, and in the end, predicted the impacts, which happened around the limb of Jupiter, within an accuracy of one minute. Um, so it was sort of the first test of actually, in fact, it was the first time that anyone had ever witnessed uh, a major impact on anything in the solar system. You saw the evidence of it afterward, lots of it, but this is the first time that anyone ever watched one. And of course, because we had a year warning, um, due mainly to Carol and Shoemaker. This is her husband, Gene, who was also famous in his own right, and David Levy. Um, uh, because they found this about a year ahead of the impact, uh, not only most people who were interested in astronomy were watching it, but Hubble Telescope and all kinds of other telescopes. In fact, just about every telescope in the world was focused on Jupiter uh, that night, and it was incredible when these huge impacts uh, uh, happened and, and left blemishes in, in Jupiter. So what are these things? Well, they, this is a, a, a picture, um, similar scale of three asteroids uh, that we have visited uh, up close and personal. Uh, in fact, we have visited now, if you count both comets and asteroids, 11 of these bodies with spacecraft from Earth. Um, this is Matilda over here, and Gaspra, and this is uh, Eros, I mean uh, Ida, excuse me. 
uh, they're obviously not that close, these are just put together, but they're all to the same scale. And this scale is about 60, um, uh, 60 kilometers here in the long dimension. This is about 60 by 23 or so, just to give you the scale. So let's look at what do we see here? Well, the first and most obvious thing is that with the exception of Matilda over here, they're not spherical. Um, this one is not at all spherical. There are lots of them which are even less spherical than, than, I, than Ida over here. Second thing you see is craters. So even asteroids get hit by asteroids. Um, in fact, if you look at um, Matilda over here, let me point out this crater here. There's another one on the top that's about the same size. You've got a crater here, quite literally half the size of the asteroid itself. Now, when you look at that and you have any sense of structural mechanics, uh, the big question is how in the world do you form a crater like that without having broken the, the asteroid uh, apart? So uh, from this and lots of other more uh, detailed evidence which has occurred, we have come to understand that many of these asteroids, if not most of them, certainly the larger ones, um, in fact, are uh, they're a bit like a marshmallow or a big piece of styrofoam. You kick it and you make a dent in it, but it just absorbs the impact and it doesn't shatter. These are not big, solid pieces of rock. In fact, they're pretty much thought to be highly fractured rock, um, almost loosely assembled boulders uh, with a bunch of dust uh, spread between them. They're generally called by people in the business rubble piles. Um, they're loosely held together by gravity, but there's not much structural strength there. It turns out that Ida uh, happens to have a companion that is called Dactyl. It was the first case of a binary asteroid that we found. Uh, they come in pairs sometimes. About 15% of near-Earth asteroids, or asteroids in general, that we found are, uh, turn out to be binaries. And uh, that's an interesting thing, because when you have a binary, now they're rotating around one another, and uh, because uh, of that, you can figure out, in fact, the mass of the larger one, the mass, uh, if they're highly different in size, you can determine the mass of the, of the larger asteroid, uh, the larger partner. If you know the mass, then you can certainly calculate the volume through the photography. Now you have the density. And the density of these asteroids, many of them, turn out to be very, very low. Uh, the basic rock of which they're comprised has a a, a specific gravity of about three or four, um, three, or, three or four times more dense than water. Um, but uh, these, in fact, uh, the bulk density is down in the vicinity of two, two grams per cubic centimeter. What that tells you is, because they're made, they have to be made of rock and metals, and what it tells you is there's a lot of empty space in those things. So that styrofoam model is okay, except for the fact styrofoam has a lot of structural strength too. But these are not what you might think, the big solid rocks in general. Some of them are, but very few. Well, these happen to be main belt asteroids. This one is the first near-Earth asteroid that was ever discovered. It also is the largest one. This is the asteroid Eros 433. And the near Shoemaker mission flew around this for over a year. Uh, we have a lot of information on this. It's the largest of the near Earth asteroids. It's 26 kilometers long, so it's very large, which is why it was the first one discovered somewhere back around 1946. Before we go any further, let's uh, do a little bit in terms of terms and definitions. Um, you'll hear me talk about near Earth objects or NEOs, um, their asteroids, and short period comets whose orbits cross or nearly cross the orbit of the Earth. Um, the two terms are almost interchangeable, and NEA would be a near-Earth asteroid. Um, uh, in fact, about 99% of the NEOs are, in fact, asteroids and not near uh, short-term comets, short-period comets. Uh, the same way, potentially hazardous ones, that's a subset of the near-Earth objects, 
um, which, if you project out 100 years or so, have a closest approach of about uh, 19 lunar distances. They come within 19 lunar distances of the Earth uh, over, let's say, a period of 100 years. We call these potentially hazardous uh, objects because um, if one swings by Mars, for example, or even another uh, uh, near-Earth object, um, close enough, their orbits can be distorted to the point where they will impact the Earth. So um, that ends up being about 21% of the total population we put in the potentially hazardous category. And the same thing for PAGs, for asteroids. The Space Guard Survey is the current search program which is looking for tracking and cataloging all of these near-Earth asteroids. Um, and the goal of that program is to, within a period of 10 years, it started in 1998, in 10 years to catalog 90% of all of the near-Earth asteroids over one kilometer in diameter. Only the big ones. Those are the, those are the crowd killers, and we'll get into that in a minute. There's now a, a new report um, uh, that has just come out, which is basically recommended after many years of everybody pushing it, to move that one kilometer target down to 100 to 140 meters, because while these are the ones that do damage around the whole planet, in fact, you have a lot of damage created by the smaller ones, and they happen much more frequently. So the current recommendation is to go down to a much smaller size. So let's look at um, let's look at where these guys are. Uh, this is not what I learned in elementary school. Um, uh, this is the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter out here, with Mercury, Venus, and the Earth in here, and the Mars orbit. Um, so each of these green dots is a known and numbered uh, as main belt asteroid. Um, you can pick any number you want for the total number of asteroids in the main belt, but uh, if you don't pick one that has nine zeros behind it, you're wrong. Uh, but of course those things uh, don't stay there. Uh, they, they do for, let's say, millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, but there are resonances created by the planet Jupiter, and these things occasionally get bounced out of their orbits and end up coming into the inner part of the solar system. And these red dots, which are exp expanded here, are all near-Earth asteroids. These are asteroids which now loop into the inner solar system. Some of them are in near circular orbits. Some of them loop all the way back out to Jupiter and back in. Um, these are not static here. You can't picture these as staying there. They, 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 this is a snapshot of all these things. Um, but now let me point out that this is, all you're seeing here are the current near-Earth asteroids that happen to be within the inner solar system instead of those that have looped out and are out here at the moment. Um, as of about, a, this is about a month ago. So you're talking about something like a uh, couple thousand, maybe, maybe a little less. If you go down to 140 meters, or let's say 100 meters in diameter, instead of talking, um, you know, a couple thousand, you're talking on the order of a million of these things. So the whole inner solar system <coughs> here would be filled with red dots of this size. Um, so when people talk about, uh, in this business, that the Earth is literally orbiting uh, the sun in a shooting gallery, that's quite literally what a legitimate statement. To make that even more explicit, let me let me run you from June the 1st of 2001 to June the 1st of 2002 in a little movie that a friend of mine in Europe made for me. Um, the Earth is the blue dot here. Um, the, these are four near-Earth asteroids and four others will enter into the picture here in a second. This is actual data from the year, from this one year, and these are only eight, but they're the eight that came the closest to the Earth that particular year. But this is what it looks like if you have the eye of God looking down on all this. And now in your mind as we go through this, what you want to do is multiply the number of these things by, uh, you know, 100,000, 
100,000 or something like that, and multiply one year by, you know, you name it. Stewart did 100,000 years. And you get some idea of the fact that it's only a matter of time before we run into these things. Now, to give you a slightly different feel, this is, again, done by my same friend. And what he did here was he took, again, the Earth here. And now he plotted all of the known, potentially hazardous asteroids. Remember, this is only 21% of the total known uh, is. And what he did was, was just plot one year of all of the known PHAs. And again, as soon as we get the detection programs really cranked up for the smaller guys, we're going to end up populating this space with a thousand times as many of, of these guys. Now, of course, I, you know, I, I probably don't need to point out to most of you that the, that the size of these dots is much, much larger than the actual size of the asteroid in, in terms of this perspective. Even the Earth is much smaller than the size of that dot. So uh, they look like they hit here, but they actually don't. Nevertheless, there is a real world that we're living on, and these things do have finite size. So this, this looks complicated. I want you to forget about this box up here and forget about most of this stuff. Picture this graph with just that big dotted, uh, not dotted, but dashed blue line, because that's really what, uh, what the assumed population of the Earth asteroids is. And I'll explain this chart a bit, because it, it's important to get a picture here. Um, here you have the number of, uh, the number of years before an impact of any given size. So let's just take, for example, this is a log scale. So this is powers of 10. So 10 to the 0 is 1. So that, what that means is every year, we're going to have an asteroid of that size hit the Earth. In other words, you come over to the blue line and up there. And what that says is we're going to have about a, uh, what, it's going to be about a, energy is about, uh, that's 10 to the minus 2, so that's 10 megatons, uh, excuse me, this megatons, so there's uh, 100 kilotons, there's 10 kilotons, so we're looking about uh, 3 or 4 kilotons, uh, 3 or 4 kiloton impact every year, that means uh, something that's about 4 uh, meters in diameter enters into the earth, it hits the earth every year, gives you about a 3 kiloton explosion. Uh, that's on an annual basis. Now it's very interesting because a couple of years ago, in fact that about a, just a little over a year ago, at the height of the tension between Pakistan and India, one of these things, in fact a little bit larger than that, it, it turned out to be about a 12 kiloton explosion occurred over the Mediterranean where a near-Earth asteroid entered in and exploded. If the Earth had only turned slightly less at the, t at the time. If it happened two hours earlier, it would have occurred right over Pakistan. And tell me now if the India, if the Pakistanis would not have thought that that was an Indian nuclear weapon. Uh, so these things can have real consequences aside from coming down deeper and hitting people on the ground. Well, that's a small, you know, those are the small ones once a year. Let's go down here to uh, 100 million years, 10 to the 8th, okay? At 100 million years, we're going to have, that, that's something like uh, 600, uh, what is it, 10 to the 8th megatons, uh, so about 60,000 mega, 60, megatons, and that's about a 10 kilometer object, size object, and that's going to happen once every, um, every 10 to the 8th, or once every 100 million years. And that's, that, in fact, is the Chicxulub event that we saw earlier that wiped out the dinosaurs. So Stewart's test here was what happens in the next 100,000 years. Well, here we go, 100,000 years, 10 to the 5th. We come in here, and what we've got is about a 6,000 megaton. 10 to the 4th is about 10,000, so that's about a 6,000 megaton event as a result of a 500 uh, meter, there's one kilometer, so it's a 500 meter diameter uh, impact. And you can pick any size that you want, go up there and figure out how often they're going to hit. This, this chart is, in a sense, the compilation of all of the analysis which says, what is the population of these guys? 
What is statistically, what do we got? What kind of an environment are we operating in? Now, just to uh, then make that explicit for my friend here, in the next 100,000 years, we're likely to see one 500 meter asteroid of about 6,000 megatons blown off. But at the same time, we're going to see 10 200 meter asteroid impacts, 400 megatons. The largest nuclear weapon ever made by humanity was made by the Soviets, and it was about 60 megatons. So that gives you an idea. You've got to put together about seven of them to come up to, to that, and, uh, you know, what, 100 of them uh, to, to come up there. Um, and, of course, it keeps going. So we should see in that same 100,000 years about 170-meter asteroid impacts. This is a little bit larger than the Tunguska event, which I showed you earlier, which if it hit over a populated city, would clearly wipe it out. Even more interesting, in some sense, there's about a 10% probability in that 100,000 years uh, that we would be hit by a 1.2 kilometer diameter impact. That then has global effects. Now we're dealing with a mini Chicxulub kind of thing. It's not going to ex create extinction, probably. Of, uh, it may wipe out, wipe, that might wipe out the human race, but it certainly is going to leave a lot of more resilient animals. Again, to put it in uh, a little more uh, direct perspective, uh, <laughs> there's the Golden Gate Bridge and there's our 500 meter asteroid. That's what we're talking about. And this is an actual asteroid um, uh, put again to scale. And this is another binary, one of the binary asteroids that we found. Uh, the primary is 800 meters and the secondary is 300 meters in diameter. But this is our 500 meter to scale with the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, what, what happens when these things hit? Well, what are we talking about in terms of the, uh, the, the consequences? Um, this is another one of those same plots. Let me just point out here uh, this, this red 20 kilometers per second. That's about the average velocity of, that one of these things has when it impacts the Earth, when it hits the Earth. So if you follow that dashed line, that's the average. If they're faster, you know, for any given size down here, um, obviously, if, they, if you're dealing with the faster speeds, you have greater destruction. This is the radius of destruction in kilometers. Uh, here you see, you know, the area of Los Angeles. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. There's our, this is the radius, not the diameter. So a 500 meter diameter object, which is the one that we just figured we're going to get hit with in 100,000 years intersects that line up here, so you've got about a 110 uh, kilometer radius of total destruction. These curves are pretty well known. There's not a lot of uncertainty here because uh, we've been screwing around with nuclear weapons for a long time. So we have a really good idea of what happens when you have megaton events blowing off. I mean, it's, a, it's a quite a well known Thing. So these are, these are quite accurate. Um, if, on the other hand, we have uh, uh, 10 of our 200, or rather our, yeah, I guess we have 200 meter uh, asteroids, um, those things are going to create about, uh, well, what, three times the area of Los Angeles or something like that, two and a half times the area of Los Angeles gets wiped out 10 times uh, in 100,000 years. And a uh, hundred times in that hundred thousand years, we've got these little guys, 70 uh, meters in diameter, and uh, they wipe out something just about the size of Los Angeles, only a hundred times during that hundred thousand years. So that's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, now, I, I'm going to grant you that we're talking so far statistical data. Everything I've talked about is, is statistical, but it's based on actual observations. The statistics that we get on these things, we, one of the ways, I'll give you an example, just look at the moon and count the craters of different sizes. You can figure out, you know, it was a 10 megaton impact that creates a crater that size. So you count up all those, you divide by 5 billion years and you get the flux of, uh, of asteroids that size. That's on that chart I showed you a little while ago. That's one of the ways in, uh, that you figure out the population. But there are many other ways. So the statistics that we have are quite accurate. So when I start talking about, you know, 10 or 100 of these things, different sizes, it's with fairly high confidence today that we can say 
these, statistically at least, this will happen. Okay, but what about the reality? We are actually observing and searching for these things and finding them and cataloging them. So when we find them, then what we do is we take one out of the statistical category and put it into the known category. So if there are, for example, um, let's say of the large NIAs, the ones over one kilometer, we now know that there are about 1,100 of those things total out there. And at this point, we've discovered 700 of them. We've actually seen them in telescopes, we've measured their orbits, and we project ahead 100 years with the accuracy of the tracking that we have, you can project reliably for about 100 years. We can say right now that none, not a single one of those 700, in fact, is going to hit the Earth in the next 100 years. Now, on the other hand, the other 400 that we haven't seen, one could hit tomorrow. They could hit 100 years from now, 10,000 years from now. But, you know, that's still in the statistical category. But in a sense, we've retired or we've diminished the statistical probability by finding these things. And when we find them, we find so far, knock on wood, that none of them are going to hit us in the next hundred years. However, as we start going to smaller and smaller asteroids, the population gets much higher, we get hit much more frequently. So it's really only a matter of time when we go down to asteroids uh, in the vicinity of 70 or 80 meters in diameter, that we're going to find one with our number on it. And that's the importance of the search programs, is to both provide some reassurance that we're not about to get whacked tomorrow, but at the same time, when we do find one that's got our number on it, we, it, it in all likelihood is not going to be hitting us for decades. In other words, you pick these things up as they go by the Earth, fairly near the Earth, and you project that ahead and it's going to go around the sun. You know, there are neighbors. We circulate around the neighborhood for, for millions of years. And so by projecting the motion, unlike our neighbors in reality, where you can't really predict how to move around the neighborhood, these are very predictable. One of the wonderful things, as Stuart was telling one, you know, remarking, one, one, of, one of the wonderful things uh, about orbital mechanics here, about Newton, uh, and his buddies is that you know there are very few weird things out there. There's no friction in a vacuum, so you can project well ahead of time, and you can say with pretty good knowledge. You measure to arc seconds of accuracy uh, with radar. You measure to millimeters per second of velocity, so you can you can make pretty good predictions. I'll give you an example of the extreme of that, which was uh, asteroid 1950 DA. It created a stir about uh, two and a half, three years ago when uh, astronomers saw it and it looked as though, in fact, it, uh, some of this, when, when you first see one of these things, your accuracy of measurement is not so great because you've only tracked it for a short period of time. And therefore, there's an error band around what you're seeing, what you're measuring. And in fact, if you project out ahead 100 years, that asteroid spreads out into a huge error ellipse, and uh, it, you know it's really not very certain whether it's going to hit you or not. But some of the potential solutions showed that there would be an intersection with the Earth. So uh, people started looking at these things, and the astronomers went back in history. One of the things you do is you project backward in time to say, has this thing been seen before? And you look on old photographic plates, old databases, Lo and behold, they found out it was first seen in 1950. So now you've got like 50 years of data points, you know, where it was 50 years ago and where it is now. The result of that is you have a very precise knowledge of that particular near-Earth asteroid. Now we can say right now that 1950DA has a 1 in 300 chance of impacting the Earth on March 16th, 2880. And I'm not kidding you. That's literally the statistical reality of, of that asteroid. Now, it's an exception. Most of the time, we only have enough data to project 100 years. But that's, that's what we're looking for, is that kind of ability to project out. So in the general case, when you detect one of these asteroids, it's not about to hit you. It goes around the sun many, many times, and then three decades from now, five decades from now, 85 years from now, or 2880, 
you see, yes, indeed, we're going to be in the same place in space at the same time as that asteroid. So the detection program, then, is awfully important if you want to do something about these things. We don't just want to know where they are and catalog them. We want to know, are they going to hit us? And if they are going to hit us 20 or 30 years from now, let's take some action. So here, we're now going to get into the idea of deflection. And this is what I'm especially involved in, and uh, so part of the, the rest of the talk will be in this area. There are two general types of ideas with deflection of an asteroid. You've got to push the suckers one way or another, right? So uh, you can either push them impulsively, that is with a hard, quick hit of some kind of nuclear explosion or directly impacted, or you have another set of uh, techniques which use slow, controlled acceleration, either get up against it and actually push it very slowly, or you boil off the surface with a laser, a concentrated mirror or a laser, and when you boil off the surface, the asteroid gets pushed the other way. Um, just to give you a quick summary of the results of this, and we're not going to belabor this, but uh, the direct impact technique, um, impulsive technique, is, is not very practical. Uh, it turns out that you don't hit it in the right direction unless you make an exceptional uh, design, and if you do that, then the cost goes out of sight. It's not a very effective way to uh, change the orbit of one of these asteroids. Nuclear uh, explosion is a little bit more effective. Um, of course, there are another bunch of problems in terms of treaty violations of weapons in space. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns because, remember, these things are like kicking a marshmallow. So you blow off a nuclear weapon next to one, and then they just sit there and absorb it. You know, make a little dent in it or whatever. But you don't know what's going to happen, and you have to know an awful lot about the if you want to deflect it. You don't want to go up there and say, oh, well, we didn't use quite enough. You know? I mean, so there's a lot of unknowns about the effect of nuclear weapons or nuclear explosions on these objects. So it's very asteroid characteristic dependent. And um, if you think about defending the Earth against uh, impacts for, you know, ad infinitum, what that means is you're going to have to have nuclear weapons hanging around the Earth ad infinitum. And I dare say that the proliferation and accidental issues create more risk than you solve by deflecting asteroids with one. Um, the other techniques, uh, uh, ablation, um, it's relatively controlled, uh, but there are major optical system problems. Um, there are a lot of problems with those techniques. Uh, the final one is the simple one, uh, but it, it, it sounds simple. It's a lot more complex than it sounds. And you go up there, you land on it, or grab a hold of it, or attach to it, and then you push with your rocket engine, your plasma engine, or whatever, for a long time, and slowly you change the uh, orbit of the asteroid. So let's, let's just take a moment to, to go over this a little bit. Let me show you the impact geometry. We're looking at the Earth here. We're looking down on the Earth at night. That's Florida, the East Coast, the United States. And this is the trace through space of an impact point on the Earth. In other words, we're going to have an asteroid hit somewhere here. And that's the path that that impact point takes uh, in space. Here's the path of the asteroid that impacts, and they intersect right here. They get there at the same time. This is the velocity vector. If you want to if you, if you follow vector stuff, that's the velocity vector of the asteroid, and that's the velocity vector of the uh, impact point. And it's the difference between those two vectors. In other words, it appears, if you're sitting at that place on Earth, the asteroid doesn't appear to come in like this. It appears to come in this way, like that. Okay? It's a difference between them. Um, so that's, that, that's what we're looking at. What we need to do now, it turns out that if you want to avoid an impact, the most efficient thing you can do is to change the size of the orbit of the asteroid. You do that by pushing it along its velocity vector. You either speed it up or you slow it down. You don't push it sideways because that doesn't do anything for you. And I'll show you that in a minute. But what, what the right thing to do here is to slow down the asteroid so that after you push it on it, it ends up being back here when that impact point is there and it goes flying past the Earth instead of hitting it. 
So here we are up in orbit, the Earth's orbit, and there's our 2004 hypothetical one asteroid. Um, and what we want to do is push on that asteroid, uh, at this point, perihelion, that is closest point to the sun. Uh, and if you push on it there and it increases velocity very, very slightly, this orbit will get slightly larger, very, very slightly larger. And therefore, because the orbit is slightly larger, it will take longer to go around the sun. So here's our task is, uh, again, this is with a slow push, but even with a nuclear weapon here, you could do the same thing. You're gonna push on that asteroid here, or in this case, we push on it from here for 200 days till it's around there. And by the time it, we get there, if we do it right, we have increased the velocity of that asteroid by one centimeter per second. That's all that's required. That's about two hundredths of a mile per hour increase in its speed, which is already 47,000 miles an hour. So you're now going 47,000 <coughs> That's all you have to do, and what happens is that the period of the orbit increases by something like 40 seconds. And so 10 <coughs> orbits later, it's going to be 4 minutes late for the rendezvous. Okay? So let's, let's look at that. There's our, our impact point and the asteroid. There's our vectors again. And there's the original impact. So after we pushed on the sucker for 50 days, it's back here when the impact point, the original impact point was there. So if we stop after 50 days, which God forbid we we're not planning to do, it would now hit here. And if after 100 days of pushing on it, it would hit here. And it would be back here at the time which our original impact point's there. 150 days, we end up at a point here that we call the liftoff point. In other words, that asteroid would then just graze the surface of the Earth. And after that, it's up in the atmosphere and out into space, uh, you know, so we have a deflection goal, a target point out here. So after 200 days of pushing, that's what we've done. In the process, we've created what we can call a, def a deflection path, or I prefer to call it a path of risk. Because if we fail somewhere in the middle of this, Instead of this act of God occurring here, we now have an act of humankind occurring here, or here, or here. So this is a non-trivial matter when you start reflecting one of these things because you put additional people at risk that weren't originally in order to save everybody. Or whatever, however you want to look at it. Okay, well, all this sounds great. Am I just standing up here waving my arms? Is this possible? Can we, can we go up there and take something that weighs you know, a, a, a billion kilograms, a, a million metric tons, and actually push on it and change its velocity. I mean, how arrogant is that, right? Changing the cosmos. Well, in fact, right now in NASA there is a program called, the, uh, a mission actually called the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter, JIMO. Uh, this mission uh, is part of what NASA refers to as the Prometheus Program. Prometheus program is a program which is to, uh, to basically develop the capabilities which will enable humankind to operate routinely beyond low Earth orbit. Not just out to the geostationary orbit or low Earth orbit the way we do today, but to make routine human operations, both robotic and manned missions or human missions, in deep space beyond low Earth orbit. Well, what it takes, of course, are some new technologies. And these new technologies have been worked on for years and are today in prototype form. Uh, this is not just paperwork. We're talking about things that are actually prototyped in the laboratory and turning slowly into actual production capability. Um, space nuclear power is one, because what you have to do is have very high efficiency electric propulsion ion propulsion, and we've already flown a lot of ion engines, as you know, or plasma engines, which are even more powerful and efficient. And all of them take a lot of electricity, especially if you want high forces, not, you know, milli pounds, but, you know, but several pounds of force. 
And so what we're talking about is a spacecraft here which has plasma or ion engines on the back end, relatively little fuel because the engines are extremely efficient, but a lot of electricity from a nuclear power reactor up here, um, and these are radiators to reject all the heat. Now, it turns out that um, when a group of us probably uh, started out, 40 of us, uh, in October of 2001, we're very concerned because we realize that the detection programs are finding more and more of these near-Earth asteroids. We keep having all kinds of scares in the press because one comes flying relatively nearby and everybody gets all excited. But sooner or later, with the detection program accelerating the way it is, we're going to have a real announcement that there is an asteroid headed for the Earth. I don't know when that's going to happen. It could happen tomorrow, it could happen 100 years from now, or anywhere in between, but it's going to happen. And what happens to the general public when they hear that an asteroid is going to be impacting the Earth? The first question is, well, who's, NASA must be doing something about it, right? Well, the answer is no. Nobody's doing a damn thing about it. So the group of us got together and decided that, you know, this is a real enough issue that we felt that quietly somebody ought to actually be doing the work that would enable us to, number one, can we do anything about it? And if we can, hypothetically, let's come up with some designs, let's actually do something uh, serious about this. So we formed a, an organization called the B612 Foundation. Now, some of you in this room may know, but uh, I'll just tell you that B612 is because that's the name of the asteroid that the little prince lived on. <laughs> so the little prince is our hero. He was there first, right? He and his rose. Um, so the B612 Foundation, uh, we formed the B612 Foundation of 501c3, you know, public charity, and if you want to write a check, please do. I'll give you the address. Uh, and anyway, our goal is to alter the orbit of an asteroid in a controlled manner by 2015. We looked at the technologies, looked at the development schedules, and decided that 2015 was actually an achievable date by which we could actually move an asteroid. Now, we're not talking about deflecting one away from the Earth. We're talking about demonstrating the capability to show humanity that, in fact, we now have the technologies in hand which will enable us, for the first time in the history of humanity, to actually control our destiny in this, in this sense. So that purpose was to demonstrate. It's not to actually keep one from hitting the Earth. It's, it's to demonstrate that that capability today exists. When people realize that, number one, if an announcement comes, instead of panic, panic is, panic is, public panic is fostered by, whether at the individual level or at the collective level, by a sense of being out of control of, of your destiny. By having a demonstrated example that we can actually move one of these things, even a little bit, there's a hope that people sense then that there's a chance. Plus the fact you're going to discover it probably 20 or 30 years or more, hopefully, before it impacts. So our job then, because we ended up designing our project around the Prometheus technologies, and in fact you see a lot of similarity here, where we've landed on and grabbed a hold of this asteroid with our spacecraft. It's, it's an example of a Scientific American from November 2003. Our job then is to convince, and I would put convince in quotes, I probably should have done it there, but to convince NASA to incorporate the B612 mission in the Prometheus program. They're going to fly these Prometheus spacecraft anyway well before, well, about 2015. So what we're saying is, instead of going out, you know, to play footsie with Pluto, you know, let's go out and develop the capability of landing on asteroids. You know, they're great things to mine. There's tremendous resources in those asteroids. Water, oxygen, you can use it to go further out into space, you can use it to help a colony living on an asteroid or whatever. I mean, there's resources out there that can be used in space 
fact, you can do commercial mining and co commercial manufacturing eventually on, on asteroids. In addition, there's, you can learn a lot about the origins of the solar system and, in fact, the origins of life in the solar system by studying scientifically the asteroids. In the same way, you can learn a lot from the comets, like Rosetta is going to do. Uh, but in addition to that, as a side benefit, hey, you get to push them around a bit, too. And in the, in the end, push them away from uh, an impact with the Earth. Okay, so that's, that's really the, the, the main part of the story. But now I want to come to the, to the, uh, the more philosophical part, and, and frankly, to a part that is, um, when I look at myself, I mean, I, I, I care about, obviously, uh, potential impact. But when I really think about what we're talking about here, uh, what I find fascinating uh, is the scope of what we're doing in terms of um, the life of, or life in the universe. Um, some of you who are older may remember when The Fate of the Earth, a book by Jonathan Schell, was written somewhere back in the 70s, I think, at the sort of the height of the Cold War. Um, Jonathan Schell's book was uh, uh, really seminal for me. I, I can remember to this day, in fact, my daughter's up here in the front row, I remember Diane sitting in, the, in our living room in Houston reading, reading this book, and I, I can remember getting to the part where he very graphically and in a very personal way illustrates the fundamental difference between me dying or us dying or a few of us dying, and extinction of life. They're very, very different. And so what I got out of that book, in, in a way, was like a club over the head, was that there is, a, there is a qualitative difference, a huge qualitative difference between individuals or even groups of individuals dying and extinction of life or humanity or whatever. Well, the other side of that coin is that living is not the same as immortality. And what we're talking about here with this capability is meeting one of the two basic prerequisites for immortality. Immortality is going to require two things. It's going to require eliminating those things which are going to create extinction of life. I pointed out earlier with Chicxulub, but also with a 200 meter, uh, 200 kilometer diameter uh, impact, you, you, you almost you sterilize the surface of the planet. Now actually things even survive that, but that's a different story. Uh, in any event, what, what happens here periodically in the whole history of the Earth is that life starts up, it begins to diversify and, and, and form a tree of life, and along comes this crazy cosmic gardener and goes whack! with his machete and wipes out, you know, a couple of branches off the tree of life. And then nuclear winter goes away and the greenhouse effect happens and blah, 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 and finally the stuff starts coming up again. And just like in your garden, when you cut things, they start growing all different kinds of ways. And they bloom again. The tree of life starts exploding. Whack! Along comes another one. Swiped by the cosmic garden, right? That's where we are today. I want to point out something people, they don't realize. Think about the dinosaurs. They got wiped out 65 million years ago. If the dinosaurs didn't get wiped out, mammals would never have made it. We made it because the dinosaurs didn't. That's why we're here. We're now on the top of the heap. Question is, are we going to be like the dinosaurs? But before I get into that, let me look at the dinosaurs. 65 million years ago. Let's picture when that is. Mentally, that's a long, long time ago. Okay. But if the Earth were formed on January 1 a year ago, and it's January 1 a year later now, when was that? December 27th. That would just happen. So it's important to understand that that co crazy cosmic gardener not only whacked life back billions of years ago, shortly after the formation of life, but he just did it on December the 27th, the last time. But now, for the first time, we have the opportunity to interrupt that process, to stop that crazy cosmic gardener from screwing
screwing up our immortality, at least in this niche, in this, this local spot in the universe. The second requirement for immortality is to diversify your location. And again, uh, through all these technologies that we keep inventing, we're gradually getting and developing that capability. And if you want to extend a couple thousand years out, you can picture that, in fact, we can be going not only to other planets, but maybe even to other, other stellar systems. So once you get to that point, now it's, you, you know, there is this possibility of life the, the experiment, what I call this great experiment in life, continuing beyond just the confines of the Earth. And that's an amazing thing, that that capability is with us right now. So the question is, do we take responsibility for life in this part of the universe? Now, I have no doubt that life exists elsewhere in this huge universe in which we live. We're not an exception. I can't prove that, but you sure have a hell of a job convincing me of that. Life that has existed elsewhere in the universe runs into the same problem. This is not a solar system problem. This is any planetary system challenge or problem. Any life which has existed elsewhere in the universe and survived has gone past this point. I have no doubt that others did not. So this is a very interesting cosmic evolution moment in time where we find ourselves. Now, you know, I'm not going to be able to sell this program to NASA on that basis, <laughs> let alone my local congressperson. But nevertheless, I, I think it is something which, you know, as you're falling asleep at night, you can kind of mull over and figure out whether you're on board or you're not on board. If you're on board, write us a check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, I, I'm going to stop uh, my part of it and ask for questions, and we'll shoot from there. Thank you very much. I know that he was just at a gathering in Southern California in some newspapers the other day and amongst uh, a whole bunch of the asteroid thwarters that are out there. And you saw the slide he had which uh, showed that there are two ways to move an asteroid. There's an impulsive force with things like a nuclear explosion, and then there's the slow, wonderful uh, oozing along that you seem to prefer. Uh, what's What's the problem with uh, nuclear impulsion? Is you know, the common thing everybody says, well, just pull a bomb here and knock it out. And uh, who actually wants to do it that way? Well, I think, uh, you know, the general sense of things is you're, you're dealing with uh, these huge, massive objects that are going like a bat out of hell and have a tremendous amount of energy all of that is absolutely true. And so the general sense of things is that if you're dealing with something that's, that's big and moving fast and has a lot of energy and it's dangerous, uh, you want to get up there with the biggest gun you got and blow the crap out of it. I mean, it's a, it's a natural knee-jerk reaction. And then, of course, uh, uh, we, we've kind of got that in the form of nuclear weapons. But what it does not understand and what it does not take into account is the fact that uh, orbital mechanics operates in such a way that very, very subtle changes in the orbit of something over time make it enough of a difference so that you can, in a very controlled way, miss the Earth, and there's no need to be inelegant about it. <laughs> Secondly, uh, you know, if you're going to depend upon nuclear weapons to do this thing, number one, they don't help you land and mine asteroids or do any science on an asteroid. All they do is blow the crap out of it which may not work, by the way, which is one of the biggest problems. But the second thing is that the other techniques offer a possibility of lots of other things which you're going to do a lot more frequently than you're going to deflect asteroids. But the worst part about it is that that means nuclear weapons is an excuse. And this is one of the motivations underneath some of the people who are arguing this side of it. It becomes an excuse to, to weaponize space. And 
for me, that personally, that's anathema. But there are some people, and we can all name names, <laughs> who would like nothing more than to have U.S. weapons, nuclear weapons in space. So here is an excuse for it. And in fact, the Chinese, to some extent, have already mentioned NEOs as a reason for their nuclear program, believe it or not. Anyway, I, so I, I, I like the elegant solution rather than, than the brute force solution. Or would one of those names be Rumsfeld? <laughs> <laughs> I know. He said it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is from Shelby. Is Shelby here? Shelby, stand up. Thank you. Shelby asks, if asteroids are like marshmallows, how are they able to impact the planet so forcefully? You know, Shelby, the best way I can, uh, I can illustrate that, first of all, I want you to picture yourself in a vacuum. Okay? And, and let, me, let me say, when, when something is moving at you at 20 kilometers per second, 47,000 miles an hour, uh, Put yourself in a vacuum now and have a marshmallow come at you and hit you at 47,000 miles an hour. Well, I think you can picture that that isn't going to feel like a soft marshmallow. I mean, that's, a, that's going to go right through your head and make a hole exactly the size of a marshmallow. Uh, yeah, so, so, you know, fluff going at 47,000 miles an hour uh, is extremely dangerous. Uh, the atmosphere, um, for something, as I said, 70, 70 meters in diameter, it comes partway through the atmosphere, and the heating and all the rest of it is such that it will, it, will, it will disintegrate. But as soon as you get up to 150, 200, 400 meters in diameter, the atmosphere doesn't even exist. I mean, it's just like it's not there at all. An asteroid of that kind will burn, I mean, a 400 uh, meter asteroid, for example, will burrow down into the bottom of the ocean at the deepest point in the ocean. All the way down through the whole ocean, hit the bottom rock, and you're going to have an explosion which creates a huge hole in the ocean. And that's where a tidal wave comes from, from the water rushing back into that cavity that's created by that impact. So anyway, I got off the track there, but uh, the fact that it's a marshmallow makes no difference at all. It's the mass and the velocity, which is the energy multiply the mass times the square of the velocity, cut it in half, you're going to get the energy of that marshmallow. And it's the energy that ultimately counts. Uh, here's a question from Eli Shuryanaji. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Thank you. No. Hello. Um, thank you. Who will fund the project to move an asteroid in the future. What is the cost of a project like that? Should the UN or other international organizations get involved? Um, that's uh, softball across the plate, chest high. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this person has read some of the things I've written. Um, well, that's a very good question. And the answer is, we don't have the slightest clue. Um, Put yourself in the position of uh, Spain. Well, make it somebody else. <laughs> make it almost anybody else. Um, an asteroid is going to hit in your country. The U.S. Department of Defense says, trust us, we got it, don't worry about it. You going to believe that? You going to feel good about that? If you're an Iraqi, if you're an Iranian, or whoever the enemy of the day is, <laughs> Um, NASA? Oh, the United Nations is going to mount the program. We don't have any idea. There is no answer to that question. And not only that, everybody is avoiding it like the plague. So there, number one, there's no answer. At the moment, we don't care about that because we think, and I say we, the B612 Foundation, think that the most important thing that can be done right now, and therefore we should do it right now, is to demonstrate this capability, and NASA can demonstrate the capability. So the immediate task is to push NASA to demonstrate that humanity can take charge of its future. Now NASA is not going to do it, but they can demonstrate the capability, and that is the number one important. 
However, look at that path of deflection that I showed there. When you start pushing this asteroid, if you fail, if the engine fails, or you blow up, or whatever, now you've dragged it off Spain and across the, to the UK. And now you fail. Oh my God, there goes London. So who decides what the path, the actual path of deflection is?